Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace City. How about we uh, pray together and then let's jump into God's Word this morning. So, Father, we, we ask this morning as we come to what is a tricky passage that you would humble us, that you would help us to sit under your Word and hear what you have to say to us this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're currently working our way through a series in the book of 1 Peter. Uh, 1 Peter is a, a book that the Apostle Peter uh, wrote to a group of churches in the first century uh, in the Roman Empire. And it was all about how to follow Jesus. Uh, now, if you had to sum up the book of 1 Peter in one sentence, it would be something like this. Christians are to be different. That's what the book is about. And so this he begins his book with this. He says, he addresses them as exiles. Or in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. And so he's saying, earth isn't your true home. And so as Christians, you are to be different from everybody else. You are to live differently and you are to think differently. And so if this is the case, well, then it makes sense that not everything that God says in his word in the Bible is going to line up with the current cultural moment that we find ourselves in, whether that's the first century or it's here in the 21st century in Sydney, Australia. And so we want to be careful what it is that we're being shaped by. Are we being shaped by our culture or are we being shaped by our God? Now, well, if it is God that we are listening to, then often what we believe and how we live is going to be different from the world around us. We're going to look different. Now, I think we need to keep reminding ourselves of this because so often I think we think about uh, just trying to fit in and trying to be like everyone else. But as Christians, we're meant to actually be different. And so this morning, as we come to our passage of what I like to call the triple S, uh, slavery, submission, and suffering. Can't see anything controversial there, can you? And so what do we do with a passage like this? What do we do with a passage that talks about slavery and submission and suffering? Well, you could just completely write it off as being archaic and out of date. And maybe if you're joining us for one of the first times this morning and you, you heard the passage as it was read out just a, a moment ago, you might be tempted just to, to turn it off. Or it might be, if you're a Christian and you're, here and you're listening in, that it's, it's sections like this in the Bible that you're tempted just to, to, to skip over, just to pretend that aren't there. I have to admit that often uh, it's passages like this that I'm, I'm tempted to not want to preach. I'd rather just preach the passages that people like. But can I suggest that as we come to a passage like this, uh, we need to, to come humbly as I prayed, uh, before God's word and work hard to figure out what it says. Now we need to ask, firstly, well, what is it saying? Then we need to ask, well, what, what isn't it saying? And then we need to ask, well, what does this all mean for us? And so with the time we have this morning, that's what we're going to attempt to do. And so let's, let's jump in. Uh, to our passage in 1 Peter 2 from verse 18. And let's have a look at what God has to say to us from his word this morning. And so as always, it'd be great to have a Bible open in front of you so you can have a look along. Okay, so let's get our passage up. It's, it starts like this. It says slaves. Now stop there. Now don't worry, we'll move faster than one word at a time in a moment, but just stop there. What do you think of when you, think of the, when you hear the word slave? Well, if you're anything like me, uh, then you probably think of the 18th and 19th century uh, African slave trade that was prominent throughout Europe. Uh, now, this was a horrendous uh, practice that was based on a lie that all people are not equal. Uh, the Bible has the opposite teaching of this. It says that we are made in the image of God and therefore have equal dignity and value and worth. And moreover, it was Christians such as William Wilberforce who based on his Christian convictions and his reading of the Bible sought to bring about the abolition of the slave trade. In fact, it, the Bible condemns this outright in 1 Timothy 1 verse 10, it condemns slave traders. But in our passage today, 
This is not the kind of slavery that Peter is addressing. Uh, he is writing to Christians in the first century in the Roman Empire. And so well, what kind of slavery is Peter referring to here? Well, the word he uses for slaves uh, is a word that means something like a household servant. Uh, this would include unskilled jobs right through to people such as doctors and even managers of estates. However, nearly all the first century uh, household servants were also slaves. And by slaves, what I mean is that they were owned by their masters. Now, it's estimated that something like a third of the Roman Empire were slaves. It was part of the economic system of the time. And so if you found yourself with a debt that you could not pay back, well, then you were forced to sell yourself and maybe even your family into slavery to pay back the debt. And usually you would sell yourself to the person to which you owed the debt. Now, there was no bankruptcy and no welfare system at the time. And so if you wanted to eat and you wanted to survive, then you had no other choice but to sell yourself into this kind of slavery until you could pay that debt back. Now, it is worth noting at this point uh, that Paul isn't, uh, sorry, Peter here isn't trying to make a comment on whether or not this kind of slavery is good or not. Often, it was a terrible thing for people as their masters mistreated them and took advantage of them. He is simply addressing the reality of the time. Like I said, about a third of the Roman Empire were slaves, and so it, it stands to reason that a, a third of the people that uh, Peter here is writing to, these Christians, were also slaves. Now, he could have just written a few verses uh, saying, get rid of slavery, and there's other passages in the Bible that talk about that. For example, in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, uh, the Apostle Paul, as he writes to the church in Corinth, he addresses slaves and says, if you can gain your freedom, then do so. But what Peter is doing here is seeking to instruct these Christians in the situation in which they have found themselves. It's far from a perfect system, but it is where they are. And so therefore, how should they live as slaves under a master? And so with all that to say, what does Peter say to these Christian slaves? Well, have a look again in verse 18. He says this, he says, Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable before God. Well, now I found it helpful to, um, to diagram it out. So he's speaking to slaves. And notice the first thing he says. In verse 18, he says, slaves in reverent fear of God. So your focus should not be on your masters, but on God. They are your tr God is your true master. So fear him. Don't fear your masters. Again, he says that in verse 19, he says, being conscious of God. In fact, just two verses earlier in verse 16, if you look back in the section from last week, uh, Peter tells them to be slaves of God. That is their true calling. And so he says, slaves, remember who your true master is. It's not your earthly master, it's God. They're the one, uh, he's the one who you should reverently fear and be conscious of. But with that in mind, Peter does say, or does give the command then, slaves, submit to your masters. And so what does it mean to submit? It's one of those words that we don't like, isn't it? Particularly in our culture. And it's often been one that's been abused even by Christians in the past. And so we want to be careful about understanding what exactly it does mean. Well, to submit just simply means to come under the authority of someone else. Now, we don't like that, do we? We, don't, we want to be free. We don't like to come under the authority of anyone. But we submit ourselves to things all the time. Uh, every time we obey the road rules, we, we submit to that. 
every time we submit a tax return, at, at least if we're honest about how much we've earned, uh, well, we are submitting to the Australian government. And so Peter says to the Christian slaves in the churches that he's writing to, come under the authority of your masters. Submit to them. Be good servants. But Peter goes a step further because he doesn't just say submit to the, the good and considerate masters. Now, often slaves who had good masters uh, almost became part of the family. They were paid well and then they, they were released when their, their debt was paid. But this is where it gets a little bit crazy in what Peter says, a bit countercultural, because he says, submit to your master even if they are harsh. Now, the word there that Peter uses is actually the word crooked. It says, submit to your master even if they are crooked. Now, he, he does qualify this in verse 20. He says, how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing what is wrong and endure it? Now, if, if you've got a crooked master and, and you do the wrong thing by them, well, what do you expect is going to happen? You're going to get punished. But, he says, if you suffer for doing good and endure this, well, this is commendable before God. Now, what is, the, what is the good that he's talking about here? Well, we saw it last week. Uh, the good he's talking about is what God thinks is good. Again, in our passage today, with reverent fear of God and being mindful of God. And so whether or not the world thinks what you're doing is good, if God thinks it's good and you end up suffering for it, well, that is commendable before God. Back in verse 12 from last week, it said, uh, even though they may accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds. And so, if you have a crooked master and you do good and you suffer unjustly for it, verse 20, Peter says, this is commendable before God. And so that's what he's saying. Now, secondly, we then need to ask, well, what isn't it saying? And it's important to do this as you read the Bible because people have justified all sorts of things because of poor or simplistic readings and understandings of the Bible. And so, well, what isn't it saying? Well, Peter's not saying that you have to do whatever your master says. That's not what submission is. Peter has twice said in reverent fear of God and being conscious of God. And so anything that goes against what God would say well, then you shouldn't submit to that. In fact, it's likely that the good that you, are, that you do, that you get punished for, is actually not listening to what your crooked master is asking you to do or not doing that. It's also not saying that a slave could never question or disagree with their master. But you need to do that in a way that is submissive and respectful. But it doesn't mean or doesn't guarantee that they will treat you well if you, even if you are respectful. Now, Peter himself, last week he said that we should submit to the authorities. Now, if you, go, you turn to the early pa uh, pages of the book of Acts, uh, Peter himself is pulled before the authorities and asked to stop speaking about Jesus. And he says to them, you need to decide whether he's right by God or man, but we're going to listen to God. And so we can't help but speak about Jesus. And so in that case, he chose not to submit to the authorities because it was then uh, in direct conflict with what God had asked him to do. Now, what does this all mean for us? Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, that, that's all good, but what has that got to do with me? Now, I'm assuming that none of us are slaves, although some of you might think that you, that you are a slave to your boss. Um, well, it's not a direct correlation, and we need to be careful as we think about this. But what Peter is speaking about is not too dissimilar to an employee-employer relationship. And so there are some principles that we can apply here. And so if you are an employee, and most of you are, in reverent fear of God and being mindful of him, you should submit yourself to your boss, to your employer. 
come under their authority, be a good worker. Not just to the good and considerate ones though, also to the harsh ones and crooked ones. Now, what could this look like in a workplace? Well, remember Peter is talking about doing good as a Christian and suffering for that. And so it could be in refusing to be dishonest that someone else gets a promotion instead of you. That could be the suffering. Or it could be being willing to speak of your Christian values or speak about Jesus in the workplace and get fired for it. Or maybe it's uh, refusing to bill more hours for your company than you're actually doing and therefore your boss getting annoyed and you're not getting the pay rise that you probably deserve. What it doesn't look like is just being a lazy and bad employee and getting fired for it. That's not suffering unjustly. But I do think the principle behind what Peter is saying here is not just for an employee-employer. I think it applies to any situation where Christians suffer unjustly for doing good. The rest of Peter will go on to say this. So if you go to chapter 3, verse 14, it says, If you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Or in chapter 4, verse 14, he says, If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. Or in verse 16, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. In fact, the, the Bible is full of this. John 15, verse 20, Jesus says, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Or Philippians 1.29, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Do you see what's being said here? If you have been told that if you become a Christian, everything's going to go well for you, well, then you have not read the Bible. That's not the promise. If we're going to be different to this world, if Christians are to stand out, then sometimes we can expect to suffer. Now, again, I'm not saying there's never a situation where we should stand up for our rights. There is. However, I think what Peter is saying to us is that should not be our first thought about my rights and my justice. But it should be about being willing to suffer unjustly because this is commendable before God. And there'll be lots of situations where we will have no rights to stand up against. For many Christians around the world, this is true even now. And so how do you do this? How do you willingly endure unjust suffering? Because my first thought when I'm wronged, when I suffer injustice, is it's not fair. Where's my... Justice, I want revenge. And sometimes I start questioning God. God, where are you? Why aren't you bringing justice? The Psalms are full of it, of those questions, aren't they? Do you know this was also Peter's first thought too? I love that the disciples weren't perfect, that as you read about them, you, you see real flawed people like us. When Jesus told Peter about the kind of death that he was going to suffer, Peter rebuked him. He said, no, Jesus, don't let that happen to you. You're the Messiah. You're meant to be the conquering king. But Jesus' response to him was, get behind me, Satan. You don't have the things of God in mind, but the things of man. Again, as Jesus was about to be unjustly arrested the night before his crucifixion, Peter draws his sword and cuts off the ear of one of the people who is seeking to arrest him as he's fighting for justice. But Jesus says, put away your sword. He rebukes him and says, am I starting a rebellion? Peter didn't realize yet that the unjust suffering of Jesus was actually what God was using. That was God's plan to bring about the salvation for his people. God used suffering to bring about salvation. Unjust suffering. 
but as Peter experienced the transformation that comes with salvation, as he became a follower of Christ and saw the suffering and the death that Jesus went to in his place, well, that transformed him. And then he could see that what the world saw as weak and foolish was actually the wisdom and the power of God, salvation through suffering. And so Peter takes us to Jesus in this passage. And so how is it that we can bear up under unjust suffering in our lives? Well, Peter says you need to follow the one who has suffered unjustly first. Have a look in verse 21. It says, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. So how are you to bear up under unjust suffering? Well, Peter says you need to follow the example of Jesus. In verse 22, he says he committed, this is Jesus, no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. He says, look to Jesus. Look at how he handled himself when he went through this most unjust of situations. The only truly innocent sufferer. But just have another look at, at this, at verses 22 and 23 again. He committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. He never sinned. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. This is not how we act, is it? Our natural instinct is to retaliate, to seek revenge, to seek justice, to seek what's mine. And so if Jesus is just your example, well, then you're always going to fail because you can never live up to this. He must first be your saviour. This was true of Peter and this is true of us. He must first be your saviour. Did you see that in verse 21? He said, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you. Christ suffered for me. Or in verse 24, he bore our sins in his body on the cross. He did what we couldn't do. And it was his suffering that led to our salvation. And it's only when Jesus is our saviour that he died for you, that he died for me, that he can then be our example too. Because it's through him becoming our saviour and we see the suffering and the death that he was willing to go through, the unjust suffering for us, that that transforms us and empowers us to live a different life. We don't need to seek our own justice anymore because like our saviour, and our example, verse 23, he entrusted himself to him, that's God, who judges justly. We don't need to take revenge or we didn't, do not need to seek justice for our suffering because we have a God who will one day right every wrong. We have a God who one day will bring about justice in this world. Now this might look crazy to the world. But this is commendable before God. This was his plan. And it makes God look beautiful as we entrust ourselves to him and are willing to suffer for doing good. And it's in doing this that others will get to see Jesus too. So let's pray and ask God to empower us to do this in our own lives. And so, Father, we, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his example of, being, of trusting you in the midst of unjust suffering. But we thank you that more than him being an example for us to follow, he is our saviour, the one who suffered for us, the one who bore our sins. We thank you that it is in trusting him and entrusting ourselves to him that he empowers us then to follow him, to live for him, to be different to be willing to go through unjust suffering and to bear that. that you, God, you see that as commendable in your sight. Father, in times where we go through this suffering, would you give us the strength to endure it, 
to not retaliate, to not seek revenge, but to entrust ourselves to you, the God who judges justly. Pray that we would be able to do this in our workplaces, in our lives, in all areas of our lives. And so, Father, we thank you this morning for your word and we pray that you would write it on our hearts and you would help us to live it in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.